if you want to run against a Dr. Oz, it is about recognizing that he is, in fact, part of the same kind of medical industrial complex uh, that exists to sell you things that you don't need that are not actually based in uh, any level of science. And yet he can plaster the, the Columbia University uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons over that to say, well, I'm a doctor, so you should trust what I have to say. What's interesting to me and what gives me some pause for concern, if I'll just go ahead and put my cards on the table, is that there has been a way that science has been talked, spoken about by the left that is, in fact, alighting the extent to which that the, the, the broad left liberals are politicizing this to an equal degree. The way liberals think about this and the way conservatives think about this is so, so far apart uh, in a way that I, I still, you know, you're still seeing Dr. Um, Fauci, hagiography and prayer candle, votive oh, candles, yeah. things of that nature. You're still seeing that people are clinging to it even more despite the fact that it's not convincing anyone who doesn't like Fauci or any of their conservative relatives. I'm extremely excited to be joined today by an all-star panel. Dr. Abdul El Sayed, a former Bernie bro, brother in the trenches, is here on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And David Weigel, you know him, you love him from the Washington Post. He's been covering um, the left beat, would you say, Dave, for yeah. a while now? I go back and forth, but I th I, that's still a huge part of the beat. I mean, that, that's about half of what I cover. and. Uh, and that's how, I mean, everyone I'm talking to on this podcast, that's how I got to know them and know what they're working on. So, yeah. All right. Well, I, I felt like you two would be the best suited folks I could imagine to have a conversation about the newest player on the political scene. And that is Dr. Mehmet Oz, who many folks know as Dr. Oz as introduced to us via Oprah and the Dr. Oz show many years ago. Uh, he's been a household name for years, our friendly neighborhood television doctor, but he now recently has announced he is running to be a senator from the great state of Pennsylvania. I want to start with you, Dave. How is this going to play? So far, Republicans who are not Dr. Oz think it will, it will not play. Uh, I guess they would say that. But I mean, I learned about Oz running from talking to Republicans who said, hey, you know, this thing you've heard about, it's for real. We have to beat him somehow, but it shouldn't be a big problem. And their thought was uh, he doesn't have strong ties to Pennsylvania. He's from there, but he chose not to live there to do a show uh, that he on COVID, and this is maybe the more cynical part on COVID. I mean, he's he is a kind of after an early period of the beginning of the pandemic where he was giving advice like uh, ch ch child mortality in schools wouldn't be that huge if you if, if you send everyone back to school immediately. He has been more of an advocate for getting vaccinated than than most Republicans are at the moment. Now, they can finesse that. But uh, when I was hearing the reasons they thought Oz was going to be beatable, uh, those came up first. And he has money, but he's going to be in a race that's one very crowded. So a guy with a lot of name recognition, maybe getting 25 percent of the vote is going to be in the top tier. But a race where other people might actually spend more money than him. It's not clear how he's going yet. He has hired serious Republican staffers, people who worked on campaigns last cycle. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not even comparable to the Trump campaign 2016, where a lot of Republicans looked at it and said, well, we don't know anyone serious who's going to work for this. I mean, you've got a combination of Republican strategists who think, oh, this guy is going to be easy to take out. And Republicans who say, well, actually, I know, I know, we're, I know the power of celebrity and this, and this guy is a potential galvanizer for our, our base, so I'm going to get behind him. I mean, it's, it's a pretty real campaign, even though he's... Uh, He's mostly been doing cable interviews. I've checked the campaign. He's only done uh, a handful of local TV interviews in Pennsylvania. He hasn't he hasn't kind of launched with the, the sort of campaign that you can kick the tires and, and, and go see him uh, on the trail yet. Not not atypical for somebody who's never run for anything before. Yeah. And in the local interviews I did see or not interviews, rather, but the local coverage I did see mm -hmm. tended to be of a skeptical nature, very different from the tone struck by a Newsmax mm -hmm. interview that I think we're going to get to and his big Sean Hannity interview. But you touched initially on the two big criticisms that have been made about him. One, that he is not from Pennsylvania, that he is a New Jersey resident. And two, um, that he has kind of allied with, let's say, Trump over the course of the last year or so when it comes to the issue of vaccines, not being anti-vaccine, as you pointed out, but showing less skepticism of uh, hydrochloroquine than some others on, on the left. And I want to talk to you, Dr. El Sayed, about that. You know, when I looked at his remarks about, you know, hydrochloroquine, which has become, of course, this very partisan subject, you know, he came out basically saying there have been some, you know, promising studies coming out of China that show that people who have lupus who are taking the drug for those medically indicated reasons seem not to be um, 
coming down with COVID at the same rates or at all. But of course, we need this, this needs to have more study before we know anything determinative. But of course, we should be, you know, excited and optimistic and looking out for treatment and not just the vaccine, which at that time obviously wasn't out yet. What do you make of the criticism that he is somehow kind of a vaccine denier um, as opposed to kind of expressing this level of, you know, openness to alternative treatments that I think has kind of created a um, distrust, let's say, among some folks who might not even be hardcore Trumpers, but are put off by this idea that there was this kind of really strong from the left, immediate condemnation of anyone who, even at a time when it was very unsure, was open to alternative forms of medicine or inquisitive about whether or not science would bear them out as effective. See, this is the the issue is that um, we, we should take the science first over the politics, right? And in the end, the first time that Mehmet Oz ever entered the, the Senate chamber, it was because he was hauled up to the Senate uh, to testify about uh, a set of treatments that he had uh, claimed uh, were effective on a show despite no scientific evidence to demonstrate that. And he so has a history. We're, we're talking like weight loss drugs, some kind of green right. tea that was supposed to burn off belly fat and all that kind of stuff. Okay, please. That's right. One of the many kinds of quack sham medications that he used to present on the regular on his show. And this is a man who puts the semblance of his medical training uh, over a number of non-evidence-based uh, medications and treatments. So he has a long track record in history of doing this. And of course, it's an easy thing to do because p the public is always going to give you adulation for being the optimist, right? And the, the thing about science is, it, is that it requires us to bring some skepticism uh, to bear on questions of whether or not something is actually going to render some uh, benefit when it comes to health and disease. And so, um, you know, I, I think taking this out of the political space for a second and saying, look, when you are a scientist or a doctor, your job and your responsibility is to the science and the medicine first. And this is someone who has sold that out to make millions of dollars. Uh, and he did it again in the pandemic. And so, you know, I, I don't like the way that hydro hydroxychloroquine was uh, was was polarized. Uh, the the issue was was never really about yes hydroxychloroquine or no hydroxychloroquine. The issue has always been about yes science or no science. And science requires us to uh, to bring receipts, and those receipts have to look like uh, randomized trials or peer reviewed peer reviewed randomized trials about the efficacy of a particular drug uh, to 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 address a particular set of claims. And so um, I I do think that the way that the the, the political conversation has digested this, uh, tends to focus more on hydroxychloroquine than it does to focus on the science. And I think when we think about Dr. Oz and his legacy, it, it really is, ha it has to be more about the fact that he has consistently put the science back uh, when it comes to his interests, whether they be his political or his public interests or uh, his financial interests. I think when we're talking about some of the kind of uh, weight loss pop culture-y type of things that he's talked about in his show. I mean, people are making fun of a segment he did about, you know, what your astrological sign can tell you about your health, you know, that sort of thing. That's a no-brainer. What's interesting to me and what gives me some pause for concern, if I'll just go ahead and put my cards on the table, is that there has been a way that science has been talked spoken about by the left that is, in fact, alighting the extent to which that the, the, the broad left liberals are politicizing this to an equal degree. So when I saw, you know, Dr. Oz's announcement, and I saw some of the liberal commentary, and I went back and w watched the videos of what he actually said about hydrochloroquine. It was far from as kind of definitive as in support as I expected, given the tone of the commentary. And my concern is that trying to paint him again as um, kind of anti-science and this idea that there's this universal science that is objective when wielded by the left, but subjective when subjective when wielded by the right, is playing exactly into the themes that he's hitting in his announcement, which are all about that there's this authoritarian impulse, that says there's one way to rule, see the world, and that he is someone who wants to break through that. Could we actually play that clip, uh, Ben, his um, announcement video? My parents came to America to find a better life, and they did. I attended great universities, raised a family, and became a successful surgeon. I invented a heart valve that saves thousands of lives. Then I started a TV show to advocate for you taking control of your health and took on the medical establishment to argue against costly drugs and skyrocketing medical bills. But COVID has shown us 
that our system is broken. We lost too many lives, too many jobs, and too many opportunities because Washington got it wrong. They took away our freedom without making us safer and tried to kill our spirit and our dignity. Now, as a heart surgeon, I know how precious life is. Pennsylvania needs a conservative who will put America first, one who can reignite our divine spark, bravely fight for freedom, and tell it like it is. That's why I'm running for Senate. I'm Dr. Oz, and I approve this message. Okay, so my concern is that he sounds eminently reasonable. It is going to sound eminently reasonable to a lot of people. He's a doctor. He certainly knows science. Look at him in a cap and gown. Look at him holding those babies. I mean, how do you think this is going to play, Dr. El Sayed? Well, I mean, look, I, I think the, the issue with, with Dr. Oz is that he hasn't been telling it like it is. He's been telling it like some companies pay him to tell it like it is. And that, that, is, the, that is the issue. And I, I agree with you, Rook. Look, I think, I think he is a very serious candidate simply because the right has shown that they can get behind a carnival barker who says things and has built an audience out of saying things uh, brashly and publicly uh, and um, that substance doesn't really quite matter all that much. And so, yes, I, I think he is a formidable candidate. I think his message is going to sound uh, really quite reasonable. I, I think if you want to run against a Dr. Oz, it is about recognizing that he is, in fact, part of the same kind of medical industrial complex uh, that exists to sell you things that you don't need that are not actually based in uh, any level of science. And yet he can plaster the the Columbia University uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, over that to say, well, I'm a doctor, so you should trust what I have to say. Having run for office myself as a physician, I do think that um, you know, it is important to remember that that there is a lot they don't teach you about politics in medical school, mm. um, and that uh, that he is going to have some bumps on the way, and uh, and so I do think that he has to be taken seriously. I do think that the way to take him on uh, isn't necessarily to you know to to make an issue out of yes hydroxychloroquine or no hydroxychloroquine. I think it is about um, about about more importantly. Uh, uh, covering him for what he is, which is somebody who has profiteered off of telling you things you want to hear uh, to get you to buy stuff that you don't really need. Mm. And th that's actually how Democrats so far have greeted him. I mean, they're not quite sure what to do about him, but you know, Val Arcouche, who's one of the Democrats in the Senate primary, who's a doctor and that, that just every, every press release says Dr. Val Arcouche, Dr. Val Arcouche, when she, when she, when Oz got in the race, she didn't talk about there's particular things he endorsed. He, he said, uh, that he was a TV personality who peddled uh, for-profit and unproven treatments, and it, and it wasn't really as sharp as I think you could probably get uh, get people in a, in a focus group to get to get that statement. Mm -hmm. But but it wasn't what you're talking. It wasn't what people are fretting about here. It was this guy's a fraud, and we should run him against a fraud. It wasn't, it, but it wasn't it's very clear what was fraudulent. And and yeah, that right. video. I mean, like people are who are used to seeing Dr. Oz in in their in their rooms. What is the reason they have to not trust him? Uh, if you're if the people who don't trust Dr. Oz are often writing for some paywall news outlet they don't read and they that might not be aware of it. So right. there needs to be a lot of work done to say, explain people, oh wait, no, actually you shouldn't trust them. I mean, the, the what to distrust him over, I think is really key because mm -hmm. what I'm seeing as I consume the content he's putting out, consume the interviews and then consume the coverage is that the, while there's a slam dunk on him peddling this silly stuff on his show over the years, one could come to the conclusion that that's a de minimis harm. I'm not saying that they sh one should, but that, okay, he 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 used, as he put it in that uh, in the Senate hearing, you know, uh, kind of over-the-top inflammatory uh, kind of salesmanship language to, uh, that, that even he admitted in that context of that hearing was inappropriate. I, I do think uh, I've made it more difficult for the FTC is that in an intent to engage viewers, I used flowery language. I used language that was very passionate, but it ended up not being helpful, but incendiary. And it, it provided fodder for his unscrupulous advertisers. But if you're kind of blanket saying he's been a dishonest broker about medical disinformation, to the average year, you're going to think that you're criticizing his COVID coverage, which many people are not going to perceive to be as inappropriate as the description actually is. And I want to ask you about this, Weigel, because you recently published a piece in the Washington Post uh, called The Trailer, the Omicron yawn, as a COVID variant looms, Republicans run harder against mandates. And mm -hmm. it does feel to me that there is a, a belief on the right, rightly or wrongly, that this is this is solid ground for them, that there are enough people that are concerned about mandates, are concerned about kind of the back and forth and misinformation that for, from a conservative point of view has been coming from both sides. Fauci says, wear masks, don't wear masks, it'll hurt first line worker, frontline workers. And then all of a sudden, of course, we're supposed to be wearing masks. And to them, there is an equivalency 
on both sides of the aisle that has led to a level of distrust that's going to lead a lot of people to say, okay, I don't know anything, but I know that Dr. Oz has been on my TV for decades as a trustworthy figure. And so I'm going to believe him over in either, either, either camp of politicized rhetoric. I think that definitely could happen. I, I see there's a way for Democrats uh, to walk into that or to, for Oz's primary opponents to walk into it. Uh, you're right. And because he was not a political figure before, I mean, he, he's he generally friendly, pretty friendly to Donald Trump. He donated to Democrats more than Republicans. Uh, mm. Because he wasn't really in in the fray, uh, he's doing what I think is harder for some other Republicans, is kind of retconning the last year and a half into one where liberals were in control of everything and they locked down everything. Mm. Uh, not quite, even it refers to Washington got it wrong. Okay, well, who's Washington? Uh, if you're if you're in any state, there you, there was no lockdown that Washington did. It was your it was your governor. It was maybe your county official, and it's gotten really atomized now. And I'm sure everyone here has the same experience. If I'm in LA County, I'm wearing a mask. If I'm in Orange County, I'm not. Uh, so there's this there's this mixture of things that I, I think if if your main uh, position is I don't want to be locked down, I don't want to be like uh, like March 2020. Nobody's really running on that. Nobody's saying elect me. I'm going to lock things down if it comes to that. Even the even the president will rule it out and say no. It's uh, the offer is really everybody get vaccinated so you don't have to do that. Uh, but the intensity of feeling is all on the well. We've seen the government's true colors. If they're if they're if they've got the power and they're back into a quarter, they're going to take our freedoms away. That's not a majority position. May I point out the piece that you were just mentioning? Uh, pollsters in Virginia, exit pollsters, asked voters, well, did, what do you think of mandates for workers to get vaccinated? What do you think, uh, who does better on COVID, on, on managing the pandemic? Both of those questions, 54% of Virginians said well, they were okay with mandates for workers, but companies were implementing, and they trusted Terry McAuliffe more on COVID. But the intensity was with the, the people who were describing, who think that uh, there, there just was this almost accident, on purpose or accidental collusion by the elite that that had no idea how normal people live, uh, and they are uh, at any moment they could they could threaten to lock us down again. They could uh, get us fired. I mean, really, the getting people fired who otherwise would have a job, but there's a vaccine mandate that's pretty potent. There weren't more of those people, but a, a one fifth of people who said actually I'm fine with mandates voted Republican anyway for other reasons. So it's it's not an issue that Democrats can just run on and say, we're the party that knows how to, to, to manage this pandemic. We're willing to do what's risky, even if it's political and popular. Um, because even when it is popular, uh, there aren't enough of, of their voters who say, well, I was angry about inflation. I was angry about this. I was furious about, about that, but I'm going to stick with this party because of COVID. It just doesn't, it's just not been working that way in this very limited sample of one election that happened a month ago. But still, yeah. that, that's the sample I'm going off of. Yeah, and, and this is this is what is so troubling to me, because it does seem like the mandate conversation taps into a deep reservoir of anxiety mm -hmm. and, and anger and resentment and all of these sorts of things. But some of these other issues don't. And if, if Democrats get caught up in this battle of, you know, uh, horse dewormer uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. he's the next Trump and he's piling around with Trump, all this stuff that I think that they can fail to tap into what I think is an, uh, an authentic threat through all of this. And your piece, Weigel, you pointed out, you, so you're contextualizing how Republicans are responding to the Omicron virus news uh, around Thanksgiving. This is from Texas Representative Ronnie Jackson, who tweeted, it's political motivations from Democrats and people in the Biden administration. Jackson, a medical doctor and former presidential physician physician said in a Monday interview with Newsmax, quote, it's monetary motivation from people making this for crying out loud. How much money are they going to make if every person on the planet has to have the vaccine, has to have the booster? And then we have to have seasonal vaccines every year. This is the kind of argument that I hear from parts of the left, this kind of skepticism of big pharma questioning the overprescription of certain medications. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of argument that I could see credibly raised by people on the left, people like yourself, Dr. El Saeed, who are running, who was, you know, just a few years ago, running a race to be governor of Michigan and running on a statewide Medicare for all plan, you know, kind of drawing on the same anxiety about the failure of our med medical system and the pharmaceutical industry to push towards something that I obviously would support, like a state based or universal, ultimately Medicare for all system. And it concerns me that it seems like the right is tapping into those same impulses, but not it to motivate voters to ask for a, a single payer healthcare system, but instead to just um, kind of express their anti authoritarian mm -hmm. fears to uh, support these conservative candidates. I mean, what do you make of that? 
Yeah, I mean, this is exactly where where the drop off is, right? Is this to say, listen, yes, I, I don't question the science of pharmaceutical industries. I question the business eth ethics of pharmaceutical corporations. And my solution to doing that is that we should regulate them in that we allow public uh, insurers to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs, that we limit the amount of money that they can overall make, and uh, that we force them to um, to give their IP abroad to countries uh, to be able to manufacture their own. So there's like a clear rejoinder to my criticism. There, you know, I've never seen a Republican in good faith ever uh, actually talk about regulating uh, the, the largesse of financial corporations, limit the amount of corporate uh, investment that they can make in buying and selling politicians through uh, through Citizens United based, um, you know, or... or, or uh, rendered packs. I mean, these, 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 this is where the drop-off exists. And you're absolutely right. This is about riling up a base to get elected, to continue to, uh, to, to sell them out um, to your, your corporate sponsors. I, I do think when we talk about Dr. Oz, there are a couple of things that we, uh, a couple of cognitive biases that sometimes we commit. We assume that because he's a doctor, that the race is going to uh, fall for him on, uh, on his position on COVID. I just don't think it is. I just don't mm. think COVID you know, is uh, or at least COVID directly is the kind of uh, electoral issue that um, many of us who pay a lot of attention to the pandemic think it ought to be. Uh, I think it's going to more fall fall on uh, questions of school and school openings. It's going to fall on questions of uh, inflation and macroeconomic policy. Uh, it's going to fall on where um, the 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 e economy more generally is, whether or not people can buy the things that they want. And then the second issue that I actually think is going to be his biggest Achilles heel is the fact that he's not from Pennsylvania, right? I mean, he hasn't lived in Pennsylvania for years. And if you actively choose not to, you know, buy, live in, in, in uh, buy or rent in, in that state and you choose to live in the state next door, you can't just come home and then claim to be from that place. And so, you know, he's running against Washington. You heard that in the in the tape which is what almost every uh, uh, candidate for Congress or, or Senate always does. Um, and so the issue is a local one, and, and it's going to be local issues. And the fact that he is a clear carpetbagger um, is, I think, going to be where uh, where 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 the biggest attacks are going to be. And so in some respects, he's going to try and run on COVID because he's going to want to fit that into his positioning as a doctor. I just don't think it's going to work for him. There's a lot I want to pick up on there. I mean, I, but I want to go back to the beginning of your statement where you said, you know, you distrust the... Um, kind of financial motivations of the pharmaceutical industry, but not the science coming out of the pharmaceutical industry. Is it fair, though, to push back and say sometimes those things affect each other, that there are times that non-scientifically indicated decisions are being made by these kinds of institutions as a consequence of political capture? When it comes to the, to the, 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 the prescription drugs that they want to make, yes, we, we don't map. I mean, in, 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 it is such a failure of our system that we don't map the drugs that are, uh, are research developed and ultimately manufactured to the pathology that exists in our population. I mean, the kind of drug that you want to make if you're a large corporation is, uh, is, is Viagra, right? It's a, it's a kind of drug that people are going to have to take m multiple times, uh, and it's, it's not for a disease that could kill them. And so to or that end, you're, or Lipitor, right? To, to that end, well, Lipitor, I mean, in, in the end, Lipitor is a great drug for cholesterol and heart disease is the number one killer in America. It's that we're not investing in making, let's say, antibiotics, right? Even as uh, we know that 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 bacteria are are, are starting to win uh, the arms race between uh, their own evolution and, and our, um, our uh, antibiotics. The, the, the issue, though, is not about whether or not the, the, the drugs that are made are safe and effective. In fact, when it comes to their trials, that's probably one of the only places that they actually have to be transparent. Now, there is a certain level of regulatory capture. I mean, we had the issue of Agihelm, which is this Alzheimer's drug that was uh, approved despite the fact that the advisory panel voted 10 to 0 with one abstention. Uh, not to approve it, but that's a regulatory decision. Is, is and, this the one that cost like half a million dollars or something a dose? That's right. That's right. And but you know, it, but the 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 studies, right? They're there. You can you can go uh, and look at the studies yourself. And so, I, I want to be very nuanced when we have this conversation about pharma, rather than to focus on the science or whether or not the claims that are made about safety and efficacy are true. That that is, um, you know, it, it, we have ways of falsifying that and. Ultimately, they have to be transparent versus the business ethics about what prescription drugs that they they choose to research and develop and manufacture about the regulatory decisions that are made about what actually gets approved as a function of, you know, what what is available in the market on a particular disease. But when it comes to claims about safety and efficacy, you can be pretty sure that when the claims are made, that they're safe and effective, that they're safe and effective. And but the, um, but I encourage people to look point, into that. This is kind of the point that the... 
I don't want to call them pro hydrochloroquine people, but like the people who were. Look, there were there were two camps uh, last year, basically. There was a camp that said this thing is dangerous. It's a horse to warmer and anybody who's using it is a joke. And there was a camp that said, well, let's say there's three camps. There was a camp that said this is like a miracle drug and everybody should hoard it and take it. You know, but I think that was a fairly narrow band of people. There was this more mainstream, let's say, Dr. Oz branch of people that said, we don't know what this is going to do yet. It needs more study, but it could be possibly beneficial. Uh, we have now a randomized trial. That's what was lacking. A randomized trial done by the Chinese that supports the potential benefit of this hydroxychloroquine compound for patients with COVID-19. They randomized 62 patients. So it's not a big trial, it's small, but it was enough to give them, they thought, a pretty good idea of whether there was any benefit or not. The authors argued that it, right, it supports me... the decision by China to use this drug routinely. And this is what concerns me, because the kind of rabid response from some sections of liberal media that said, this thing is literally animal medication, you know, it's going to make you sick if you kill it. I mean, to your point, um, Dr. El Sayed, this is something that has been long approved by the FDA for the treatment of malaria. It's not, you know, that has relatively minor side effects in the grand scheme of things. I mean, no one wants to be prescribing and taking drugs with any side effects if it's not medically indicated. And so that's obviously the point that is, has been made and that even Dr. Oz himself made. But in when you have the kind of pushback against the possibility of hydrochloroquine at that point in like April or May of being useful. It, I think that's, that is the point that even a FDA vetted medication for a different purpose, of course, is being characterized so dishonestly, frankly, by the liberal media that people are in this place where they're going to be much more open to, so to just to trusting the person who seems to have been at least an honest broker throughout this, which may to many eyes be Dr. Oz. So I want to, I want to first, so the horse dewormer is actually ivermectin, right? Okay, so that's sorry, you're right, you're right, my bad. Um, and, uh, and hydroxychloroquine is a, a great drug we've been using for malaria and we've been using for, uh, for um, uh, diseases like lupus and, and mm -hmm. uh, other autoimmune diseases for a long time. That being said, we do know that there are a lot of, of, of side effects and, um, the, the the truth is is that you don't recommend a medication until you know that the benefits outweigh the cost. And the problem was is that we're somewhat divorcing what Dr. Oz said from the context in which he was saying it, where you had the president of the United States claiming that somehow this was going to be the drug that saved the day with COVID. And when you come on as a physician and you in effect confirm uh, in the context of the president's claims that in fact this is the you know the golden pill. Uh, so to speak, even if you're not saying it in those words, you have to understand the impact that it's going to have on the choices that people make. And that was before we understood that actually in trial after trial, hydroxychloroquine was more uh, deleterious to patients who took it uh, than it, it, it offered benefits. And so this was irresponsible in the context of not having had the science to demonstrate that. And let's be clear, right? Even if something is FDA approved, you still don't understand what the impacts of COVID-19 are going to be to all the pathways that that drug touches in the body. The other point I want to make here, which is which is I think also um, really quite important, is that I, I don't, like I told you, I don't believe in the hydroxychloroquine discourse. I believe in the science discourse. And the thing about science is that we've done a real bad job at explaining to people how science actually works, which is to say that there is no book, there is no COVID-19 book that we pulled off the shelf and turned to page 365 and here are the treatments for COVID-19, here's what you do to prevent COVID-19. We didn't know that. And so you have to wait for the science to actually answer the questions before you actually say, yes, this is what you should do or this is what you shouldn't do. So for right. you to be or to put yourself as an arbiter of science, which is implied when you come on as Dr. Mehmet Oz, Right. And then to, uh, to, 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 to betray the scientific process that way in the context of a carnival barking president who's telling everyone that hydroxychloroquine is going to save the day because ultimately his goal is to stabilize the market so he doesn't lose the election. Right. That context is really important to remember. Uh, and so that, that is, I think, why um, we have to maybe put a couple asterisks uh, on his, his, his statement taken out of context. Yeah, I just I just do want to point out that in the in at least the statements that I saw him making on the news, what surprised me, given how his statements had been covered, was how much he did actually caveat and say the the science the studies haven't borne this out yet. What the evidence that we have is based on a very small sample size, so of course this isn't conclusive. And then ultimately, when more studies came in, to your point, that 
indicated that hydrochloroquine wasn't going to be useful, he said as much. Now, you know, should he have immediately said, absolutely not, don't, you know, don't take it instead of giving the room? I think that he said something like, uh, I understand why people who are desperate would want to try this, given that there aren't other treatments and, you know, being suggested at this time. I think that's a very fair criticism. But to your point about science being nuanced and there being no, like, playbook, I'm very responsive to that. And I think it's very true. But that is not how science is being kind of weaponized as, if you will, by the liberal media, which says you have to believe science, trust science. Fauci says, I am science. You know, and that, I think, is part of what is so politically damaging, potentially. But um, Dr. Elsa, you also raised this point. Oh, go ahead. If you go ahead. And no, I just wanted to jump in on that. Look, no one person is science. And the, the reality of science is that science uh, is a process by which we actually do not firmly conclude anything. We just take the status quo of what the studies tell us as the truth for right now. And the Im implicit in science is that it could change tomorrow. There is something that could change the fundamental way we understand any given thing. Now, what happens is that you start to settle on a consensus. And once mm -hmm. that consensus starts to settle, the probability that it gets overturned it becomes minimal. The, the, the fact is, is that I, I don't agree with a political conversation that 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 um, that presents scientists as the science, right? And I think we have to uh, we have to push back on that, which is exactly why I pushed back so hard on Dr. Oz's statements that, you know, he understood exactly what he was doing. He was trying to be science and put some sort of veneer on science when he went on, by the way, Fox News uh, to talk about why, in effect, right, to back up the president's arguments uh, around hydroxychloroquine before the science actually bore out. And so, yes, you're right. No one person is science. But when Dr. Oz, right, has a television show that's syndicated for a long period of time and he's trying to tell, you know, people sitting in their living rooms and you name the place in, in America that they should take X, Y, and Z drug to lose weight or that this is the right way to uh, to improve your mental health. Um, he is trying to be the science. So let's just call it out where it stands on both sides. Well, uh, let me turn to to you, Weigel, because, uh, you know, uh, Dr. El Sayed pointed out that there are these other factors that are militating in the race. The fact that he is has been a Jersey resident. The uh, people have been frustrated that he used, I believe, his in-laws address to vote in the last cycle. Um, he says he's bought property in the state and is planning to come back and that his he was married in the state and then he went to medical school in the state and has all these other ties to the state. There have obviously been instances of carpetbaggers being successful, particularly notably Hillary Clinton in New York state. But there's this other, this other point that Dr. L.C. just made, which is that the, this is really going to be about less about COVID and more about school closures, the way that it manifested in Virginia. I would argue that those are overlapping issues, right? That there's, you know, there's no disaggregating school closures from COVID. But I'm curious what your take is on how that issue in particular is going to continue to play in this post youngkin loss world. Uh, it's it, it's, it's hard to predict world. what people will still be angry about in November 2022, because at that point, you probably will have had I'm going to guess with schools, you're going to have had a full year of schools back. And, and I mean, I, I, every pick prediction I make is caveated with something terrible could happen and erupts this. But if on the current trend, we have that you might have because test scores declined the year of learning loss, you might have them increase. You might have less anger than you do right now on that particular issue. Uh, so I don't know how, we, how that how that's going to play. I do think the overall approach he takes, uh, the reason I think he, it, he's correct that there's going to be some political uh, upside. There's some good political audience for what he's doing. Uh, is that it? It's it, it, not every celebrity candidate does this, uh, but Trump did. It's that yes, I've been accused of being unethical from time to time, but I did it for you. I did it because mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking out for ways that you can beat the system. Uh, doc, you you go to your doctor. You don't like the opinion. You get a second opinion. You don't like it. Well, I'm on TV and I'm a doctor and I'm telling you this is something you might want to try. And this is the the, the extended Oprah cinematic universe has lots of people like this, <laughs> right? But but I, I the the that um, attitude. There's a reason when I, we were talking at the beginning, I I mentioned the polling because that's not actually a majority opinion. It is, I think, uh, if not a majority, close to it in in a Republican primary and a kind of MAGA Republican primary. The the that idea that this person has been very successful. Uh, and he's just trying to tell other people how to be successful too. Uh, that there are giant pillars of the economy based on that sort of approach, and not not to mention not to mention politics in post Trump is, is based on that. And there isn't really a great liberal answer for it because there's not there's not a, 
maybe we'll figure out one here. I don't think there's a version of liberalism that says they're all wrong. Uh, be an individual. Try it. Try it yourself. You can you can beat the system. Uh, it's about creating a system where everyone succeeds. So you're never just as a, at a conceptual level. You're not. I don't see what the anti Dr. Oz argument is to convince that person. Your your hope has to be most people don't find it very convincing. And look, people can become convinced that somebody that some somebody is sleazy. I think the opening there on the pharma stuff um, that 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 uh, that Dr. El Sayed was talking about. That to me was the most compelling part of both the, the the launch video and the way Oz has talked since he since he announced. It's not just about the many the many issues you could you could draw off of COVID. It's I took on the pharmaceutical industry. I took on big I took on big pharma. I took them on. Well, what does that mean? And can a Democrat say, as as Dr. El Sayed was saying, here's what we could actually do. Here's actual legislation. I think it's tougher when they have a majority. And for filibuster reasons and for normal, you know, I got a donation so that, and they told me not to do it reasons, uh, they're not going to deliver on everything that a Democrat would want to run on or that have run on if you're a Christian cinema. Uh, but I think that that is a probably more fruitful area of, of, of political attack than than on the science question. I do think the way liberals think about this and the way conservatives think about this is so, so far apart uh, in a way that I, I still you know, you're still seeing Dr. Um, Fauci, hagiography, and prayer candle, votive candles, oh, yeah. things of that nature. You're still seeing that. People are clinging to it even more, despite the fact that it's not convincing anyone who doesn't like Fauci, who any of their conservative relatives. So, I mean, that's that I feel like is a, a campaign that Oz would want to have, especially in a primary. Yeah, I had a date this past summer ruined by a, a fight about a, fa- a Fauci lawn sign. So <laughs> For example, liberals yeah. are still very upset about this. Yeah. Um, but t- to your point, though, I-, I want people to get a sense of how he is running, like what the rhetoric is, is around this, because I think for a lot of folks, they might not quite realize how Republican he is. Mm-hmm. I think people who might like him from, as you put it, the Oprah cinematic universe might believe that he might be some kind of rhino, that he's soft peddling it, that he's running as a moderate in a state that's gone both ways. But I want to watch a clip from a Newsmax interview he did, which really showed the, the, the tone of his campaign. What is your view on Trump? Uh, talk about him. Um, uh, do you want his endorsement? You know, I'm, I'm my own person. I, I don't want to put in the box. I'm very proud of who I am. Uh, but I do respect what the Trump voter is feeling, which is they recognize that someone stuck up, stood up for them. Someone took hits on them. Someone fought for them. And they want their turn. And he also did things that I think he didn't get credit for. I mean, no matter who you are in this you know, political spectrum, the Operation Warp Speed success, the gift to the world of the mRNA vaccines, I'm not for the mandates, but we, I do think that believe the vaccine was a plus. This is something we should be celebrating. Instead, it was the opposite. People are literally rooting against what President Trump was trying to do in COVID. And at the time, we were sitting there thinking, well, how is this even possible? And as a doctor, I'll tell you, when you mix politics and medicine, you get politics. Dr. Fauci, your take on him. Well, Dr. Fauci says something very unfortunate last weekend. He said that he was science and people who didn't like him don't like science, don't respect science. I think this whole concept of believing in science is foreign to me. I believe in God. Science is something that you trust, you work on, you improve. There's no finality to it. Uh, you, you, and you know, you know, we have an, a J. Edgar Hoover of public health right now, and that's not what we want. We just want to have people coaching us, giving us advice if they're scientists and let the people who are decision makers who have been elected by the people of this country to make decisions accordingly. And that process has been thwarted a little bit. It's been off kilter, not balanced. So, oh boy, I wasn't expecting the pivot from Dr. Fauci is over identifying himself with science to I don't believe in science, I believe in God. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, I just, you know, those two things are, are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, and. <laughs> Uh, in in his mind, right? This is how you play to uh, the Trump base, and you know you, you think about all of the implicit uh, stereotypes and tropes that he played to, and mm. talking about you know people just waiting in line and other people jumping in because of federal action. I also love the fact that you know he blames Fauci for the uh, mandates, and he contrasts that with letting the elected officials make decisions. Sorry, man, that was Joe Biden's, the elected president of the United States, decision, and. Um, I also think that he overestimates the the degree to which to which the vaccine mandates are a negative. I I, I personally think that uh, this is one of those issues that um, Democrats ought to campaign on, and every single time uh, he uh, he 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 pushes against them, he's creating uh, space between his persona as a doctor and arbiter of 
science and um, and where those folks are going to vote. Because in the end, right, I get it. He's talking on Newsmax and he's speaking to the Trump base. Those folks don't don't give a damn about science in the first place. And if your call is, well, I'm a scientist and a doctor, right, and you think that that's going to be persuasive to the middle voter, I think you're missing that middle voter in the air. Yeah. Hey, I was a history of science major and even I stopped giving a F. <laughs> I also just wanted to point out, we've talked a bit to death, so I don't want to get back into it, but I also want to point out that that judging of the of the early 2020 conversation about some of these treatments, he he he, he turns this conversation over I, over these uh, alternative medicines into one about whether or not people were rooting against Trump and rooting against the idea of, of having optimism and some kind of solution. And I think that's very smart. <laughs> very cynical and something that Democrats should be watching out for because they're on one on one camp and on one channel having a conversation about how he's misrepresented the public. And he's having a very different conversation about how, you know, pe- Trump and him and people in his position were trying to find something for a population who was de- desperate for something. And ultimately, there was a cohort, at least in people's imaginations, that was rooting against Trump being successful for political reasons. But the, the irony of it is that then we found something. It was a safe and effective vaccine. And then all these people are rooting against that. So I, I just, you know, you, you got to choose. Are you going to have your cake? You want to eat it? Like, well, that, it's well, your that's choice. The, that's, the, that's the kind of dis- disturbing magic of Dr. Oz is that he's <laughs> maintaining support and belief in the vaccine and encouraging people to get vaccinated. But he does things like um, he, he did a segment on his show about uh, how many antibodies occur from taking uh, one dose of vaccine. If plus having had COVID, right? So he says, well, people who have one dose of vaccine plus have COVID have more antibodies than people who have taken two doses of the vaccine and should be having a more robust conversation about whether or not the second jab is necessary for everybody. And should we, is the third jab necessary for people and all of these other kinds of things. And so living in a world of ambiguity that's separate and apart from just pro or anti vaccine. You know, in some respects, uh, you know, I'd love to know whether or not he was ideating this run when he decided to to do that episode because mm. I think he's setting himself up to um to to set to identify a whole sort of middle region where he can again try and have his cake and eat it too and say, mm-hmm. "Listen, well, I was opposed to these the strict construction of what the proper regimen for a vaccination was." And so I was proposing uh, you know, m- middle positions. Um, while he can also then also say that he's not he's not a full on anti vaxxer, right? right? I mean, this is a this is a smart hedge on his on his part, but it's just that it's a political hedge. And in the end, right? In the end, th- there's there is a reason why, right? Two and now three vaccines were recommended um, because you know, and I don't want to get into this too much in the science here, but but the fact of the matter is is that if you've had COVID your antibodies are going to be less durable and more specific to the strain that you had and mm. the variant that you had. And so the thing about the vaccine is that it's designed to target the, what we call epitopes, the part that a, a vaccine targets uh, that are more durable across variants. That's part of the reason why. And if anybody's ever you know, gotten a new phone and you train it on your thumbprint or on your face, you got to show it different parts of your face or different parts of your thumbprint, right? So that it recognizes it better. There's a reason you keep putting your thumbprint on there. And it's just like a vaccine. There's a reason you keep showing your body it uh, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to recognize that no matter what angle I see it from. And, you know, this is a, a political hedge. And he's right. The one thing that he said that was true is that when you mix politics in, 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 in medicine, you get politics. And that's exactly mm. what he's done. Mm. Dave, what did you make of how he sort of sidestepped the question about whether or not he wants Trump support? Interesting, because in Pennsylvania, in a, a Republican primary, that wouldn't be bad. But it Asking for Trump support on, on Newsmax is uh, you're going to get his attention. He's watching it, but it's up to him whether he decides to put a put a finger on, on the scale in the primary. Uh, so good good in terms of a non-answer. I thought it was a good political answer. The whole spirit thing. So that's been a theme in his rhetoric is that what we need is, lead, is leaders who make who make us feel good and they're not divisive and they increase our spirit. And if that sounds familiar, yes, that's a thing that Joe Biden ran on a lot. And I think a lot of people ran on it. Mm. It, it, it jumps around the details by saying. Uh, we just we've had leaders uh, who have who have been suppressing the American spirit. It doesn't really mean anything if, if, it, if what that means is that uh, so it is, if it was a governor who did say, don't stay at home, don't reopen your hardware store. Was he suppressing the American spirit was passing, you know, uh, uh, PPP loans to people who taking them? Was that suppressing the American spirit? 
it's 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 smart campaign opening gambit because I, I'm debating what that means. It's it's a little bit more. Uh, it's both more insubstantial and more meaty than just saying I'm running on this uh, this size of a tax cut. Uh, but it's, but it, it, there are follow up questions which he's done. Uh, I'm not saying he, he's going to get you know Aaron Sorkin to buy some interviewer who 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 reduces him to 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 nothing. I mean he's a TV professional. He's not going to get caught caught up by a, a unfamiliar question. But there's not a lot of substance there. It's not clear what the substance is going to be because uh, there, th- this is changing very quickly. He's been there watching how quickly the COVID positioning changes. His advantage is running for Senate. Frankly, he's not like he's running for governor. Where he has to take a position on whether he he would. He would uh, change the way the state responds to vaccines. It's a job where he's going to go there and be one of 100 people debating stuff. So he, he has a lot of opportunities to dodge. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of what's going on in the field? This is a Republican mm-hmm. seat he's running for, right? Uh, formerly held by Republican. Mm-hmm. So this is a- Pat Toomey. Uh, Pat Toomey, who's retiring after two terms. He won two terms, both by very narrow margins against kind of flawed Democratic candidates. So Democrats have thought for years that th- this is... I wouldn't say right for the taking, but a seat they shouldn't lose as often as they do. They've never been able to flip. It was Arlen Specter's seat. So the one time they held it was an Arlen Specter switch parties. Uh, but you have in, in in the governor's race and the Senate race in, in Pennsylvania, just basically everybody who thought about running is running. So you have I, more than a dozen candidates. So the Democratic side's crowded too, but the Republican side, you have the lieutenant governor nominee from last cycle. You have a... Uh, County ex- executives have been trying to move up to something bigger for a long time. You have uh, Lou, Lou, Bar- Lou Barletta, who ran for, sorry, oh, in, the, in the governor's race. Sorry, I'm stepping over my own point because I just talked to him about the, Senate, the governor's race and he ran for Senate last time. But anyway, you have a big crowded field of people, none of whom are that very well known. You have uh, on the sidelines uh, this effort to recruit David McCormick, who's a hedge fund CEO, uh, into the race and, and Republicans, this is the Republicans I'm talking about who think that you can beat Dr. Oz with somebody like that. They mm-hmm. think, okay, we'll I have somebody who's more like a Glenn Youngkin sort of figure, which is because he just won. He's the model for everything now. A rich guy who has some, uh, he has military experience. Uh, he's going to, he's going to go in there and introduce himself as an outsider. I'm not sure that's a, that's a, a, as obvious that's going to work. Um, but then you'd have two people don't really have a political litmus test. I mean, there's not many people in this race really in a lot in, in many races, this year who have long electoral experience and that's why they're running or sorry, that's the resume they have for a Senate campaign. You have a lot more people who are just angry, kind of fed up citizens and somebody who is very famous and very good at TV, I think starts an advantage, but nobody, it's not like he's going in there and trying to take out a, a particularly strong candidate uh, until he got in. And I think he was, his, his storyline was helped by this, although he did, he was planning to run before this happened. Uh, but you, uh, Sean Parnell, the sub, uh, veteran and author who ran for Congress in 2020, um, raised a good amount of money, was at the RNC. He was running for Senate. Trump endorsed him because he fit Trump's bill. He was a handsome military veteran uh, and just got dragged down by this very messy uh, divorce, uh, legal battle with his, his wife over ch- uh, child custody. He finally just backed out of the race. So they went from having a, fr- a Trump-backed kind of quasi-front runner who a lot of people in the party were not very comfortable with to having a quasi, a, the most famous candidate, I'm not sure if he's a front runner, being, they're not sure if Trump backs him yet, uh, mm-hmm. but they know that they're know that they not quite sure what, what he believes apart from what he's, been say, what he's been saying. So he does, this opening effort he has to just reintroduce himself as a political figure and say some stuff that's, a, that's pablum and some stuff that, that's a little bit less pablum, uh, I don't think it's it bad for him at all. I think he's done a really good job introducing his campaign and, yeah, it, yeah, and people I mean, who don't like it he had, like need to make a affirmative argument of why he's not it's, it's, qualified it, to be a senator. It's it's compelling. It's it's a lot yeah. of God and country stuff. He's leaning in. He says, I might not, you know, be, have been living in Pennsylvania, but I hunt in Pennsylvania. I mean, he is right. like playing the hits in a way that I didn't know I didn't know he had it in him. I truly never would have imagined, frankly, that he was a Republican before this moment. But I wanna ask you, Dave, like, is this an Andrew Yang situation? Is this a situation where all of the media's attention goes to who might, the person who might be the most famous candidate in the race. And it distracts us from concentrating on the person who might be the bigger, you know, from my perspective, threat to progressive interests. It could be, but uh, I, I'm sorry, but I'm very good guess because it's, I've seen so many races get out of hand that I, I stopped predicting what will happen. I don't think <laughs> uh, I don't think Democrats should uh, should root for anyone in particular if, if they care about who wins the race. There's, it's not clear which of these Republican candidates would be less legible. It's clear which, which ones are less known and have less money. So Dr. Oz is better known than anyone else is going to run. 
David McCormick is going to have more money than anybody else who could run. If you push a Democrat, they'd probably rather run against Sean Gale, who is a ran for county commission. Well, there's a bunch of candidates who don't really have uh, a great chance of victory. They probably should be rooting for in this race before before one of those guys, because th- this is the most de- crowded Democratic Senate primary, this in Wisconsin, mm. where you also have the party ha- in a real time fight over not just what they stand for, but who's electable. I mean, you have mm. John Fetterman's version right. of electability, you have Connor Lambs, you have Malcolm Camiata, who's the black gay uh, uh, assembly me- sorry, uh, legislator from Pennsylvania. Um, they barely had time to pay attention to the Republican race for Senate. But and. I think after 2016, I stopped hearing Democrats say, we hope this crazy looking person wins the primary because we, mm-hmm. can, we can beat him. But yeah, I, I, it's, 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 uh, Oz is in a pretty good position considering nobody has taken a swing at him yet and they're not, and they're not quite sure. They're all, they're all waiting until um, McCormick gets in the race. But you know, Carla Sands, who was a Trump ambassador and you get to be a Trump ambassador, especially under Trump if you're rich, she's a wealthy businesswoman, she's already in introducing herself as an outsider so mm. I can see a situation where there's a few outsiders and the one who is very, very famous has been on TV for a decade, probably longer, uh, th- where he has the advantage the whole throughout the whole race. Mm. Well, my lizard brain is hoping for that Fetterman-Dr. Oz matchup, but that's just my lizard brain, not my ethical brain. By far uh, the most the most clicky <laughs> race to cover, definitely, if we get that one. I'm going to be uh, there a lot, yeah. Dr. El Sayed, I know that you uh, have to run soon, so I want to give you any last uh, chance to say any last remarks, uh, and maybe as a prompt, you know, what advice would you have um, for anybody who is going to be trying to make the most of Dr. Oz's history of um, medical misinformation, kind of peddling the stuff about the diet pills, this kind of showman putting showmanship above uh, medicine? You know, what are the what what should they focus on, and what might potential um, pitfalls be? Well, look, from a from a you know political standpoint, what you really want to do is identify people who followed some of the things that he suggested that they do and identify folks who were hurt by it because mm. they're out there. And, um, you know, when you push, this is the thing, right? When you push misinformation and disinformation, there are real people who are affected by it, particularly when you color it with the veneer of science, which is implicit in the fact that it is the Dr. Oz show. Mm. Right? He wasn't just the Mehmet Oz show with a, you know, a random dude with some opinions. No, he was mm. the Dr. Oz show, right? And, uh, and so I think, you know, identifying the people who've been hurt by him um, is, I think, really important. The, the other piece here is, uh, you know, I would, playing to the, to the physician angle, um, you know, you, there's two approaches here. You can hit him where he's strong or, or hit him where he's weak. Hitting him where he's strong is to say, look, you know, you, you, you tout yourself as this famous surgeon come TV host about, you know, empowering people. Here's all the people you've hurt. The other point is just to say, like, you're not from here and you are clearly just another carnival barker who is coming to our state because we have an open Republican primary because you like to see your name in the lights. That's been your whole story, your whole life, right? You are uninterested in actually helping people. You are more interested in looking like the guy who is. And to you, this is just another opportunity. And yes, you happen to be a good talker. You're really, really good at finding the good story and the talking points, what you did on TV. Uh, you made millions of dollars and now you're not satisfied with the millions of dollars that you've made. Instead, uh, you want a, a seat in in the Senate so that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, ah, I am Dr. Senator Oz. Uh, and aren't I the best? Um, and so this is someone who is an elitist elitist who thinks he can pull one over on the good people of Pennsylvania. And I hope that they recognize that he has never had a modicum of interest in service in his life. He is a quack who has leveraged his uh, positionality in society to sell people shit they didn't need. Uh, and now the product he's selling is himself. Yeah, it's funny that every part of him is elite from his educational background to the amount of money he's made. Um, and yet his pitch is very much that he is the one that's going to take down the elite. So we'll see how that plays out. Thank you, Dr. El Sayed. Where can people find you and anything else that you have going on right now that you might want to draw attention to or promote? Sure. Yeah. Um, I hope folks will check out The Incision, which is my uh, newsletter on Substack. It's incision.substack.com. That is my phone alarm telling me where mm-hmm. I have to go. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, The Incision, uh, incision.substack.com. And then uh, if you want to have an interesting conversation about science, um, I host a podcast on Crooked Media called America Dissected. Uh, and then, of course, um, if you're interested in engaging what we really can do to take on the pharmaceutical industry, my book with uh, Dr. Micah Johnson, Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide, is, is a really important step. Um, I think, to, to really engaging with uh, what we could do to, to actually bring the pharmaceutical industry to heal. And then, of course, I'm at Abdul Al-Sayed on uh, Twitter and Instagram and at Dr. Abdul Al-Sayed 
uh, on Facebook. So appreciate you having me, Bree. It's always uh, fun to, to be in conversation with you and Dave, and I hope that we can do it again sometime, okay? Thank you. I appreciate it. Dave, can you stay for a few more minutes? Yeah, I could stay, I could stay for a couple minutes. Dave, what do, you, what do you think of this idea that there might be a lot of people who don't actually think that he's Republican? or think that he's not really a Republican. Is this an open, open primary? Is, it a, is there a concern that Democrats might vote for him? No, yeah, Pennsylvania is a very closed primary. I mean, this, okay. is, this is a reason why uh, w- when they were a little bit delusional, Republicans were hopeful that, uh, that, that they could beat Trump in the, in the 2016 primary. They didn't understand the appeal he had yet. So they thought mm-hmm. loyal Republicans wouldn't vote for him. Uh, so it's gonna be uh, a, a, a Republicans only primary, but the Republican Party in in Pennsylvania has been adding more registered members. I mean, just the Trump campaign made this effort to convince everybody who maybe was a a yellow dog, fifth generation Democrat, but they always voted Republican for sheriff or something, uh, come become a Republican. So it's going to be a Republican primary. I really haven't seen people take take hits at Oz yet. And I think that's some some questions about which candidates are relevant enough to make news on their own. I think they can force that. I mean, if you're, let's say I'm a Pennsylvania reporter right now, and they're really good ones who broke the news in this race, I and mean, they've been uh, vetting vetting his record and his donations. But if you're writing about Dr. Oz, you want to get a response to what he says. You have to get it from 10 people of, of whom maybe one Pennsylvania has heard of. I don't think I, 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 I cover this for a living. I could not win a qui- get a quiz right on who, who they're running for. So I think when you have a, a bigger field, you'll see some of those arguments play out. I just know that when Oz was getting in, that was the confidence. Well, guy's not really from uh, from here, and uh, he's donated to Democrats, and we can define him as somebody they can't trust as a, as a true conservative. The problem is if, if he does introduce himself as a He's not going to be the most MAGA, most pro-Trump candidate. He's just not going to be. There's going to be guys who, who, who beat him on that. But if he is the most, I'd say, individualist candidate, if he's the one who says, Unlike everybody else, I'm going to let you live your life, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to fight fight the celebrity, not the celebrity. I'm going to fight the establishment, the media, because mm-hmm. I know it from the inside. That's a very that's been a very powerful argument for some people, but it's a very small universe of people. There are not that many people this famous who are on TV this often, like Dr. Oz is. So you can't really compare him even to a, a well, Kanye this... West who was running. A, <laughs> well, no, he was running kind of an odd joke campaign, but yeah. one that didn't really have a message until the very right. end. It was not state. This is a normal campaign that's saying, uh, I'm going to use the tools that let me build the American, uh, the real American dream into my own life. I'm going to use those to, to help everybody. Uh, yeah, they need to come up with, if they want to beat them, a, a good argument against that. And I think that you're going to see that from the hedge fund candidate. It says, well, I also had an American dream and I mm. did even better and I didn't have to uh, push any pills I was paid to push in order to, to do mm-hmm. it. I mean, I, I think that's where they're going to go, where, where, they're, where I can see them gravitating to. But the first week of him in a the race, they're kind of stepping back and seeing what he does. Well, this could be a kind of a test of whether or not kind of the left or liberals have a better assessment of what actually made Donald Trump popular, right? Mm. Because ever since 2016, there has been this ongoing debate about whether or not it's just kind of pure unbridled racism that drove people toward Trump or whether it's a mix of that, along with a undercurrent of anti-establishment, um, uh, distrust of government, frustration with the lack of follow through on the on the b- part of government, um, you know, in- institutional distrust, all of those kinds of things are actually acting on the, the voters decision making, because if you have someone like Dr. Oz, who is not so virulently um, mm-hmm. bigoted, someone who has these close associations with Oprah, someone who's hugging a black woman in his his opening ad, someone who could be not very fairly painted as the bigot, you know, who was from a country that <laughs> Donald Trump might d- describe as a shithole country, you know, like this is not, of course, that it is, but like you, it would be, it's difficult, more difficult to pe- for people to fit Dr. Oz into that kind of narrative. And depending on whether or not he's actually able to capture that Trump base might be some kind of validation for the left who's been arguing that the liberal portrait of what caused Trump is overly simplistic for five years now. Yeah, well, he's not just he's not just uh, hard to bear in that way. He'd be the first Muslim senator. He uh, has said that he practices transcendental meditation, which and and both of those things. I'm I'm a pluralist. I haven't tried TM. I haven't tried Islam. But those are things generally that. Uh, I think somebody who's running as a Democrat would get different questions. And I mean, Dr. Sel Sayed, I got these. He had racists following around asking yeah. about, about Islam. Uh, they, you do get scanned differently if you're Republican because the message is 
uh, yeah, I have, I have a different life experience than you people, but unlike the left, I'm not trying to cram everyone into a box, which I, I think liberals still kind of underestimate how powerful that is. Uh, you look at, again, the Virginia election results. That was a mixed convention process where party activists chose their nominees and down the ballot where they could choose non-white nominees, they did. I mean, the, the, this mm. is really important to the, to the dogma and the, and the argument the party's making now is that we're going to welcome everybody in because we're all set against the, uh, the elites and the, the, the white liberals with their Ibram Kennedy books. We all don't like those guys. We're, we've got our own thing going. Uh, I'm, I'm probably sounding more bullish on Oz than his own campaign. <laughs> I'm not saying he's automatically going to do this. I'm saying he's got big openings that I, I do yeah. think um, at this point, even though they've been a little bit slow to realize that, uh, the liberals who do not embarrass themselves on Twitter by you know talking about white supremacy when they're talking about black candidates, uh, I think generally Democrats have a better sense that the, the Republican voter does not need somebody to ha- run down a chart and be the most conservative candidate on these top 10 points. That yeah. the, the image and the, the image that is unlike other Republicans, the ones that Democrats might have a tr- tough time responding to. He hasn't really like, leaned into that, but I do think I, it's Democrats I talked to who could see why that'd be more popular. One of the most interesting things about this is that even though in the mind's eye, Dr. Oz has been aligned with all of the kind of cable news liberals up until this point. Now that he's in the race as a Republican, there is this weird dissonant coverage that's coming out of places like Entertainment Tonight and The View. The TV doctor, Mehmet Oz, wants to be the next senator of Pennsylvania. (laughs) Let me close my lips. But it's pretty clear whose vote he's courting when he went on Sean Hannity last night. Uh, Take a look. Remember the phrase two weeks to flatten the curve, right? That metastasized into this incredible authoritarianism, overreaching, that did not necessarily make us safer. Remember they closed the parks, they shamed people about beaches, right? And now they're threatening the same overreach for the Omicron as you were just talking about. I think those choices should be yours, the American people's. I would say I'm an America first, make America great again conservative. How would you describe in just a sentence your political ideology. I match yours. I think this country has all the building blocks to be spectacular. What happened to him? What happened to him? He's gone over to the dark side. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I know. Hard to see a a doctor saying that, you know? Well, Dr. Rand, Paul Rand, uh, what's his name? Rand Paul. Yeah, but he's like a something. I don't want to... He's an eye doctor. Yeah, he's, he's, a, something, but he's, not. he's merely an optometrist. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a medical doctor. His eyes, yeah. He's, yeah. Eye he's a medical doctor. Which are important, but like... Yeah. Well, the but, eyes you are. know, it, it's it's interesting because we, we all know um, Dr. Oz and we've, you know, I've been on his show. We, we, we've all socialized with him. But... I feel like he took a turn uh, with, yeah. with, with you he think? Took a turn with, <laughs> with, but with COVID in particular, you know, I know his specialty is the heart. Yeah. But I remember in um, in April of 2020, he said um, that uh, in terms of kids going back to school, he said this. Um, I tell you, schools are a very appetizing opportunity. I just uh, saw a nice piece in the Lancet, which is a medical journal, arguing that the opening of schools may only cost us two to three percent in terms of total mortality. And he was arguing that we should open up schools. And and my thought was, so you're willing to sacrifice the lives of our children? Yeah. Was was he willing to sacrifice the lives of his children and his grandchildren? And that's when, right? And, and, that, well, he's not and that's when I hit. saw, that's when I saw the turn in him. He turned before that, that I'm point. sorry. Really? He, he turned, you know, yeah, he turned really. that when he, that. If, you, if you guys go on YouTube, there's an interview um, I did on another show with him mm-hmm. where he measured my BMI. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, <laughs> he said, you're underweight. So at that moment, I don't trust him. <laughs> 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 you gotta love joy. I yeah. mean, <laughs> um, so what was funny to me is that they all had to negotiate the fact that they were all f- obviously friends and going to dinner parties with Dr. Oz up until this point. But, you know, you looked at his political donations. Is he newly a Republican or did they just not mind so long as he was going to run for office? It wasn't clear what party he was in. I mean, the, 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 he he donated to, I mean, Donald Trump did the same thing, which also neutralized it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who are wealthy and get known by Republicans. Glenn Youngkin actually gave a million dollars over his life before he ran for governor to Republicans. And that wasn't the kind of guy Doc, Dr. Oz was. So instead, he has this sort of 
almost like a sub substack conservative way of talking. Mm-hmm. I mean, just even that clip, uh, which is a clip from the clip, he's mm-hmm. talking about they, they, they shut down the schools. They might do it again for Omicron. He's not running against, especially in the Republican primary, but in the Senate election, I don't think he's going to be running against a Democrat who says, my favorite thing that we did in the last three years was the schools being closed for, for six months. That's not mm-hmm. what he's going to do. Democrats will say, we took emergency measures and it was, pe- it was people like Dr. Oz you know, with their, their quacky behavior um, convincing people not to get vaccinated, which kept kept the situation get, getting even worse and worse. That actually, I saw a version of that argument work pretty well in California in the, in the really? recall election. Well, Cal, the argument that we're about to beat this pandemic, it's the vaccine resistors that are, that are, that are dragging us all back. They're holding us all back. Uh, I think the Democrats, their confidence in that message got shaken after Virginia. The polling is clear, but it's it, like I was saying, they don't have a electoral majority of people who come out and say my number one issue is yeah, vaccines. How's that, but how's the way that, that going to fly in the twenty twenty one where more people have died? I and mean, I'm not saying this is the fault not. of Joe Biden, but more people have died than died last year. I mean, it undermines the argument. Not not to say that vaccines don't work, but this direct correlation between the people who resist vaccines or any of the people who are accused of being anti-vaccine, even though uh, Dr. Oz weren't, are the result, are, are responsible rather for all of these deaths. That seems like the kind of bad faith attack that really put people off when Trump was being blamed, perhaps more than he was actually responsible for for the pandemic last year. With the Democrats who are actually running, I mean, Joe Biden's not going to be about in 2022, so it's going to be... In Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, who is AG running for governor, it's going to be maybe John Fetterman or Connor Lane, people who were there in some kind of position of power, arguing for what what they did. But there are the, the, their point is going to be there was horrible stuff we all had to get through that we never want to do again, and now we have these vaccines and it's basically over. Now this could all be neutralized by the Omic- Omicron variant or something like that. At the moment, that's what their argument, and so Oz is really kind of shadow boxing. Now he's not running against the person who ordered lockdowns and is going to do it again. Uh, I mean, he's, these are all pretty friendly interviews he's doing yeah. uh, where he's getting, he's getting one question. It's kind of open-ended. Uh, I think one was just literally Trump. What's your position? Uh, so yeah. he, he's, nobody's pushing back and saying that, but, but I think it is, it is intellectually com- more compelling than it was uh, a year ago to say that sort of stuff. And he can say now, he has talked so much on TV that I'm sure you can go back and find one clip and another clip in the last year. And maybe they weren't 100 percent consistent. But it's clear what he's going to do is say, look, I was out there as a medical professional telling people to like live their own lives. We would have been better off if the schools are open. Um, and he's ready for people to say uh, that I was ready that, hey, Dr. Oz, you're ready for some number of kids to die in schools. He's kind of ready to push that back. I don't think people are in great territory if they're arguing over what the good response would have been because he's very good at talking. He's a doctor. He knows his, his stuff and he wasn't in power. Uh, yeah, I, do, that, I think it's yeah. other issues that are, that probably are more promising. Once he gets into, okay, you're taking on big pharma. How exactly? Uh, maybe he'll come up with yeah. something innovative, but maybe somebody well, like Elsa. That, 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 but that is my fear. There, there was one clip that I saw and mm-hmm. we can insert this without playing it where he framed his being pulled before the Senate to respond to questions about misrepresenting the value of various weight loss products on his show, Mm -hmm. he reframed it as they went after me. The lynch mob kind of came after me (laughs) when the real problem was that uh, these big tech companies allowed unscrupulous actors to use the words I said on my show to sell their product and that I was a scapegoat. And he turned it again into this this conversation about how it's me, the little guy against big tech, the, the government, corporate actors. And I'm merely a scapegoat. I have fought to empower my audience, my patients, and now the, the voters of Pennsylvania. And I've taken on big pharma. I've gone to battle with big tech. I've gone against agrochem companies, the big ones, right? I've got scars to prove it. And I cannot be bought, Sean. Cannot be bought. And I'll keep fighting those battles to empower the, the folks of Pennsylvania and around the country. And his efficacy in doing so is concerning. And I think mm-hmm. charts a real path forward for the right in this moment where Liberals seem to have widely abandoned populism despite the growing, you know, faux populism on the right and the success of the Bernie style populism that we saw in 2020. No lessons seem to have been learned. Yeah. And I haven't seen Democrats doing all that when they talk about Oz. Even the, the folks on, on The View or this is one of my beasts of media that we will fix on this podcast is that <laughs> in lieu of a Democrat saying something, you can find somebody on The View or MSNBC who's going to say it. So, yeah, there's going to be some people who I think 
shove their foot in their mouth as they try to outsmart Dr. Oz on this issue. But you're right. I mean, you've been pointing out, yes, the 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 vulnerability that he's clearly talking around and spinning before someone else gets to spin it is wait a second, is this was this guy ethical and honest or is he making money off of recommending stuff that doesn't work? People don't like generally they 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 don't like experts, but they don't like scams either. And finding mm-hmm. fi- finding your path from not only the, uh, from okay, I'm not saying you should trust every expert and do whatever they say, but you also shouldn't trust somebody who's trying to rip you off. Uh, that is something that you know Hillary Clinton, I don't think, did in 2016. Mm-hmm. Objectively, uh, I think it is something that's been done in in, in other races, uh, but not against somebody who just talks for a living. Just you, you're you the podcast. I'm on TV sometimes, and you, you, you the I don't know, countless hours. I'd say he's done at least the uh, the ten thousand hours he needs <laughs> right. to do to get good at something. Uh, yeah. He's not going to. He's not going to be buffaloed on on some of this. I think it is more the digging that other campaigns do into his his donations and whether he benefited in this and where where his finances. I think it's kind of more death of a thousand cuts Labor that cuts, he yeah. might be ready for that that look at his, his record because a, the Doctor Oz message of. Uh, the elites want to shut shut things down again is definitely one of the most powerful things Republicans have go, going to mobilize uh, not just a chunk of their base, but I think people who might not be that interested in the midterm election normally. Uh, you know, there's lots of people who are, uh, I, I know some who they, they're resistant to getting the vaccine. Maybe they never want to get it. And they don't love, they don't pay a ton of attention to politics, but they might yeah. be interested in the guy who's given it to the establishment and telling me not that I don't have to take a right. vaccine. I think it's, I think that is potent in a way that Democrats don't really have anything as potent. It, saying follow the rules, look, that is most of the country is doing that. Most people have yeah. taken the vaccine. Most people are fine with mandates. Um, but a midterm election is not most people voting. It is, right. it is a small group of, of super motivated people. And Dr. Elsay made this point um, when he was talking about the idea that Dr. Oz is a charlatan and you know, re- trying to reframe that issue as, okay, but I was trying to hustle for you. I was, you know, I, I might have been a cheat, but I was cheating for you. And I was thinking about how liberals, many liberals have been responding to the Cuomo brothers going down this week, mm-hmm. um, ostensibly over um, former Governor Cuomo's uh, Me Too scandal and then his brother's efforts to manage it, if you will, uh, on his cable show. And there are many people who will come to their defense including a, a clip I watched in the shade room where folks said, look, I would do anything for my brother too. And they admire the fact on some level that he would, that Chris would cheat for, for his family, you know? And I think that we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which some people will perceive Dr. Oz's uh, alleged hucksterism as him trying to, you know, vet stuff for you. I was trying to bring hydrochloric I was trying to make sure it wasn't written off prematurely because I'm concerned about your interests and don't want the kind of elites that, for example, are getting access to this new Alzheimer uh, medication that no one else can afford Mm -hmm. to basically hoard things for themselves while telling you that it's not good for you, which is basically what was going on with the mask stuff earlier in the year, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, th- there are lots of ways to commodify people's desire to dissent, to, to desire to be away from the, the the crowd and to make money on something and to be healthier than the next person. I mean, uh, not every <laughs> there are lots of people who come out with diets that don't work and they don't all go to jail for it. People people buy right. it, buy it and then they move on to do something else. So uh, yeah. this is this is just anything like this where you're 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 dealing with some sort of animal instinct that doesn't necessarily play in every campaign but you're trying it in one where no one else is ready for it uh, it's always worth keeping an eye on how how effective that is because i feel like a lot of republicans when they talk the way he does about mandates and experts at the end of the day they're still you know like a josh mandel or whatever is still a lifelong politician who wants to be a politician when this is over will want to be in office maybe holding a different position a guy coming in saying look i'm i'm a doctor i know what i'm talking about uh and i'm gonna fight the elites uh we saw with trump you can put that into a blender and turn a lot of the negatives you might have into advantages. If people, if people trust you and they say, well, yeah, uh, maybe he doesn't live in, in, in this state or hasn't his whole life. And maybe he has this problem. Maybe I heard a negative thing, but you know what? Uh, I've, he can't be bought and he's telling like it is. And he's not going to, I, I can see the, the minds that is working on and they're a big part of the primary electorate. Yeah. And to that, that point about, you know, the, Sonny Hostin said, oh, he said that we could sentence one to two percent of kids Mm -hmm. uh, to death. The end of that quote, which she didn't um, Mm -hmm. include, was that he says some people might think that's a reasonable bargain. 
or some similar yeah. ver verbiage we can put it in. Yeah, I tell you, schools are a very appetizing opportunity. Uh, I just saw a nice piece in The Lancet arguing that the opening of schools may only cost us two to three percent in terms of total mortality. And, you know, that's any life is a life lost. But to get every child back into a school where they're safely being educated, being fed uh, and making the most out of their lives with a theoretical risk on the backside, uh, it might be a trade off some folks would consider. And as much as that is very uh, Craven's adding to the ear. I don't think he's wrong. He's obviously not wrong that to some people yeah. that is a legitimate bargain. And that is what this whole school reopening thing is about. That a lot of people were open to some level of death, including of children for schools to reopen or for whatever political agenda that is being pushed. Yeah. And, you know, I think liberals might overstate the extent to which that particular soundbite is damning for him because I think it speaks to a real reality that Democrats, a lot of liberals are continuing to miss here. And and who who hears 2% and thinks that could be me? Right. Usually they hear 2% and think, oh, that's going to be somebody else. That's going right. to be, not to be super callow about this, but that's how a lot of this stuff works. If you, if you're told you have a 90, your child has a 98% chance of surviving. If we just keep the schools open, a lot of people would, would say, well, I, you roll, roll the dice 50 times and, and it, it comes up 49 times my, my side. Sure. Send my kid back to school. Uh, I don't think that clip's good for him necessarily. And I actually think that a, a risk that we don't talk about that much in, in, in the start of a campaign is how things can be used out of context. Cause mm -hmm. you don't want to be part of the problem here, but I've seen candidates get just beaten to, to death with a quote uh, that is half of what they meant or they're being sarcastic and the context is there uh, and that is my thing with Oz. That he both has the as a as a handicapper. He has this ability to talk on TV. He also has millions of hours of him talking in clips you can cut anywhere you want. If somebody wants to be dishonest with how they're treating him, I mean that's in Ohio right now. Uh, I think five million dollars has already been spent using actually pretty fairly in context videos of JD Vance in twenty sixteen trashing Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I don't think that. I don't think. I'm saying I don't think that that exists with Doctor Oz. Do I know that somebody's not going to find? a video of him responding in a way that you could, and I'm talking about very unsubstantial, non-substantive things here, mm -hmm. but I, it, from a realistic perspective where campaigns often turn on very non-substantive things. Yeah. And that is why I will not be running for office yeah. <laughs> among other reasons. Thank you so much for spending this extra time with us, Dave. Can you let people know where to find you and your work? Yeah. So I write for the Washington post, uh, the newsletter that covers campaigns is called the trailer. It, easiest way just go to WashingtonPost.com and look for me. Uh, look for Dave Weigel. If you want to find the link to that, it's Twitter slash Dave Weigel. As much as we all hate Twitter, we're all stuck on it. Uh, so that is where I spend a lot of my time. And between those two things, you're going to find uh, all the stuff I write. Thank you, Dave. And to our listeners, remember that you can get an additional episode of Bad Faith every week, a premium episode that launches, that drops rather on Mondays at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. I've also started doing an additional two shows a week over on the call-in platform where we, quote, debrief. My name is in the title. That's the pun that no one seems to be getting. <laughs> we debrief on the subjects that come up on these episodes of Bad Faith Podcast and anything else that's going on in the world. You can catch that over at the Colin app the day after Bad Faith episodes drop. So on Tuesdays and Fridays. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash Podcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.